Okay. So last week I talked about joint work with Hui at Princeton on subspace embeddings and applications to numerical linear algebra problems. And at the end of that talk, I put it up to a vote as to what I would cover today. And only one person voted, who was Avi, immediately after the talk, and he said he wants to see lower bounds. So today we'll do lower bounds. <laughs> and well, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> if n is, yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's true. It was both a democracy and a dictatorship. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, I'm going to talk about lower bounds. So the title of this talk is uh, Sparsity Lower Bounds. For dimensionality reducing maps. And this is uh, joint work with Hui. Okay, and the proofs in this talk are going to be, I think, so much shorter than last week, so hopefully we'll be able to actually get through all the details. And if we have time left, which I don't suspect will happen, but if so, then I will um, mention some open problems that I'm interested in related to this. Oh, <laughs> yeah, okay, so, yeah. Uh, so if there's enough room, I'll, I'll not only state the open problems, but yeah, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> so in this talk, we're going to cover <coughs> basically three different problems, but three different problems which are all related. Okay. So the first is the Johnson Linden Strauss lemma. Uh, the second is the restricted isometry property, which is something that's used in compressed sensing. And the third one is what I talked about last week, which I'll call oblivious subspace embeddings. And I'm going to go through each one of these and define what the problem is all about. So all of these three things involve matrices that do some kind of dimensionality reduction. And the point of this work is to show lower bounds on how sparse such matrices can be. <coughs> so let's start with the first one. So Johnson, Linden, Strauss. Which maybe I should give the acronyms here. So just because I don't want to write it all the time, this is JL, this is RIP, and this is OSE. So the JL lemma was proven in 1984. Okay. It says that for all epsilon in the interval, say, 0 to 1 half, and also for all vectors x1 up to xn and rd, so there exists a matrix A, which is m by d, with m being something like 1 over epsilon squared log n. How's, how's my font size, can people read this well? OK. Uh, such that for all ij, uh, axi minus axj is 1 plus minus epsilon what, times what it should be. Okay. So the JL lemma gets used. Oh, and, and uh, this matrix A can be taken as, say, a random matrix from some distribution, a random Gaussian matrix, or say random signs as entries, and that will satisfy this lemma with high probability for any uh, set of vectors x1 up to xn. 
So <coughs> this gets used algorithmically because if I have some, say, high dimensional computational geometry problem, then if my running time is, say, exponential in the dimension, say, like nearest neighbor search, what I can do is I can first project down to lower dimension and then run my old algorithm and it'll be faster. Okay. <coughs> so that's the JL lemma. And what was known? So um, this talk is about sparsity, so I'm just going to focus on the sparsity of this matrix A. So a work by Akliopthus, so previous work on the JL lemma. Let me write um, what S, so let's say So here's the reference, and here's S, which is equal to number of non-zeros per column of A. So Ocleoptus, I think back in 01, showed that you can get S to be M over 3 by just taking a random sign matrix. Okay, so this is M over three. A random sign matrix where uh, a third of the entries are going to be, or two thirds of the entries are going to be zero in expectation. Okay? Yeah, these are upper bounds. Okay, constructions that achieve good S. Then there was <coughs> uh, Das Gupta. Kumar and Sarlosh in 2010, and they got S to be something like 1 over epsilon times log cubed n, up to some log 1 over epsilon factors. Okay, So this is only better than Ocleoptus' result if log n is a lot less than 1 over epsilon. And in joint work with Daniel Kane, um, we improved this to 1 over epsilon times log squared n. And there was some, uh, some follow-up by Braverman, Ostrowski, Rabani, which got a better tilde. So this tilde is hiding log 1 over epsilon and log log n. And then, the best thing we know was this past soda with Daniel, where we showed 1 over epsilon times log n. Okay. So you can always take a matrix with the optimal number of rows such that only an epsilon fraction of each column is non zero. And for lower bounds, um, It's up to log 1 over epsilon that's the best. You can potentially shave a log 1 over epsilon from there. Yes. I'm not going to, yeah. Well, I guess, yeah, so I can write that. So th this is the previous work for upper bounds. So lower bounds, previous work. So alone showed. M has to be at least 1 over epsilon squared log n over log 1 over epsilon. And in terms of sparsity, um, the paper, this Dasgupta Kumar Sarlosh paper itself, showed that S has to be at least something like 1 over epsilon times the square root of think log base m of n. Um, however, it was with restrictions. So I don't want to get too much into the restrictions, but basically they weren't looking at exactly this formulation of the JL lemma. They were saying, I want to come up with a distribution 
over sparse matrices such that any fixed vector is preserved with high probability. And once you have such a distribution, you can get, you can get uh, this result by setting that failure probability to be one over n squared and doing a union bound, okay? And what they showed was that this kind of lower bound holds for some specific class of distributions, okay? Um, so it was a lower bound for a harder problem and there's a lower bound for a harder problem and it's gonna be weaker than the bound we proved. So meaning that you know, a, a lower bound for a harder problem is easier to get than a lower bound for an easier problem, right? So. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Now, if the lower bound is higher than the bound we proved, then that distribution won't be. They won't be. It'll say, it'll, it'll look at the same exact points as alone, okay. and it'll say, here's a set of points. A JL matrix for this set of points cannot be sparse. And I mean, as we saw last week, um, it, there'll be a trade off between M and the sparsity. And if you choose M to be the optimal M, or close to the optimal yeah, M, you'll get, you'll get, um, so oh, yep. there's even a further restriction in this too, which is that the next thing you need to know is that the next bound has to be at least two times as good as the previous one. Uh -huh. so oh, the distributional version. Exactly. Yeah. So this will be a lower bound like for any linear map for a specific set of vectors. For, for sorry? Yes, we yes, we do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there was a paper by yeah, it, in the case where you just need to pr you need a distribution that preserves a fixed vector with high probability, we know that m needs to be 1 over epsilon squared times log of 1 over the failure probability. And so that was originally proven by uh, J. Ram and Woodruff, and then we have, I guess, a different argument, me, uh, Daniel Kane, and Raji. Um, <coughs> yeah. But, you know, since, since we prove a lower bound, we're going to prove a lower bound for this version, which is an easier problem, so our lower bound also holds for the oblivious version. Okay. So that's the JL lemma. The second thing is RIP, so definition. Um, we say a matrix A is, say, epsilon K RIP. If <coughs> um, for all K sparse, vectors x and rn, we have ax L2 norm is in the interval 1 plus minus epsilon times the L2 norm x. So it's a lot like the JL lemma, where this set of vectors x1 up to xn is an infinite set of all the case bars. Um, so why do people care about RIP? So it's useful for compressed sensing. Or as Avi will tell you, there are weaker matrices also that suffice for compressed sensing. But um, it's, it's one that's popularly used anyway. So um, consider the following sparse recovery problem. Okay. So <laughs> I have an X. I want to design. A, a matrix such that for all vectors x in Rn, um, well, let me say, I want to design a recovery procedure algorithm, which I'll call phi, and a matrix such that for all x and rn, if I let z be, or let's say x tilde, be phi of ax, then uh, 
x minus x tilde L2 norm is at most O of 1 over root k times x minus, or let's say xk. I'm going to define what this means. OK, so <coughs> by x tail k, I mean you take the vector x and you zero out the k heaviest coordinates in magnitude. So in particular, if x is a k-sparse vector, x tail is the zero vector. Okay, and <coughs> so let's let's pretend for a second that x is a, a k-sparse vector. This right-hand side is zero, meaning that x tilde will be x itself. Okay, so if x is a k-sparse vector, then our recovery algorithm phi and our matrix A is such that. Uh, phi of Ax actually recovers x exactly, meaning that from a few linear measurements, you should think of m as being much less than n. From a few linear measurements, I can recover any k-sparse vector. L2, nothing gets L2, L2 deterministic, like for all x. L2, L2, L2 is all impossible. Um, yeah, but if this is not k-sparse, Oh, well, okay, so K, you can think of K as being a parameter. So M is going to depend on K. I mean, I mean, it, it, well, maybe this is not the best way to, to state it. I mean, it turns out that this is the best bound you can hope for. There are lower bounds, and there's a matching upper bound, so that's why it's stated in this way. Yeah, but then that doesn't explain this factor, right? If it was k-sparse, this would be zero anyway, so it doesn't matter what you multiply with here. Okay. I guess what Andy was saying is why don't I put why why don't I put k here and like another parameter epsilon here, right? And then see what trade-offs are possible with this, right? But it, it turns out this is the best you can so. Um, so theorem that's due to uh, Candice, the other paper in 08, also Candice Romberg and Tao. And Candice and Tao. Um, I think there's. Sorry? Rudelson inversion? Really? Okay, I didn't know about that, but. Uh, but, I mean, the theorem statement is going to be RIP implies sparse recovery. So you're saying they also prove this? Okay, hmm, I didn't know about this. Okay, so this is 0605. When was their paper? Okay. Um, the theorem is that RIP with uh, epsilon less than some fixed constant epsilon naught implies 
sparse recovery with some poly time recovery procedure. So in particular, you solve some polynomial size linear program. Um, that's your fee, and you can do sparse recovery. So also, RIP continued. Um, it's known that M equals theta, uh, let's, say k, let's say epsilon is a constant. You know, we only care about this epsilon naught anyway. So let's say epsilon is equal to epsilon naught. If, if M is something like, uh, k times log of n over k, that's awesome. Okay. And the, the lower bound follows by some works on Gelfond widths, which I'm not going to talk about today, but it's uh, due to, I think the usual references are like Gluskin and Garnet of D. Gluskin. And this is back before compressed sensing existed, um, I think in the 80s. Are there also yeah, so, yeah, that, so, so in the way I've stated it here, <coughs> where you have one matrix, It's a lower bound for sparse recovery. It's a lower bound for sparse recovery, as I've stated it here. Um, the thing that the paper, so yeah, I can also say, there's also work by uh, Kondoba, Indic, Price, and Woodruff. And they extended it to even randomized guarantees. So even if you wanna do sparse recovery with some constant probability for, for, any, for any vector, that requires this number of rows as well. No, that's, oh, that, there are other, yeah, so, RIP implies sparse recovery, but you don't necessarily need RIP, you don't necessarily need RIP to do sparse recovery. Oh, you mean like how small does epsilon not need to be? Oh, okay. Um, I don't know what that is offhand. But I mean, we know a constant suffices, so. Um, and the upper bound uh, well, I think, well, all these papers gave the upper bound. Plus, there's a paper by Barani Uk et al., which, in my opinion, is, well, I like this one. I like this one the best because it connects Johnson Lund Strauss with RIP. So basically it, it goes it proves it in a way that you might expect having now seen JL. You 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 take some epsilon net about the set of all K sparse vectors and you apply JL to that net, and then you give some arguments saying that if the net is preserved, then the entire set of all K sparse vectors is preserved. Okay? And it gives you the right answer, K log of epsilon. How about sparsity? And then you take the union of all the nets. Yeah. So this thing is some kind of new lower bound for sparse recovery. It's just that the Sorry, say that again? Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. I mean, you know, it necessarily involves the sparse recovery. Oh, I see. Yeah, you just you mean you just need a matrix such that any set of uh, k columns is linearly independent. Right, you can first like each k pairs. Use a stronger yeah. recovery guarantee. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So
and the best, lo let me write down the best lower bound, so. I think actually this was in 2010. So that was the best known lower bound before. Oh, uh, you mean getting the upper bound? Yeah, random, yeah. Just like for j any, any JL. Random plus minus. Uh, I mean, so I'll clear up this is proof also. Yeah, the upper bound. It also, he was also like caring a lot about getting the correct constant. So he showed, he showed that if you want to succeed, so he, he did the oblivious version where you want to succeed with high probability. And he showed that m needs to be something very close to 2 over epsilon squared times the natural log of 1 over delta. So, you know, to get something so crisp, he was very careful about his calculations. But um, you can actually, so there's a Gaussianization trick, maybe I can talk to you later, where basically you can, you have this random variable, which is the error from, from, the, from uh, the embedding. And you can, you can show kind of in one line that the error in the, in the random sign case is bounded by the error in the Gaussian case. So. Yeah, something. It's, it's just an issue. Okay, so maybe I'll just write something very briefly here. What, uh, let me think of how I want to say it. So. Yeah. I think did I mean NK take uh, oh no, no 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 what am I saying that's what I meant to say why doesn't it look correct it's the min of the two So in particular, I mean, a lot of times when people actually do sparse recovery, they don't assume k is tiny. They assume k is like 1% of everything, right? So then this min would actually be n over m being something like uh, very close to a constant, right? Or even like m is like k log n over k. And if k is 1% of n, then this thing is, uh, yeah, it's something very small, right? So. Um, the lower bound kind of broke down if you got close to n. Okay, and the last. Sorry? If m is k squared? I believe that's true. Yeah. So you're not talking about the option. I think. I'm talking about, well, this lower bound holds for any m. Well, actually, now that I think about it, I mean, I know what the lower bound I'm going to show you is. And that lower bound, if m is k squared, is still pretty dense. So it's going to be something like uh, k log n over k over log k. So no, you can't get sparse things even if it's k squared. Okay, and the last problem is the oblivious subspace embedding. So, definition. Let's say D 
is an OSE distribution. over matrices, let's say, uh, m by n matrices, if for all d-dimensional linear subspaces w sub is the subspace of Rn, this holds. So what does it say? It says that, so D is also, let's say, is an epsilon D OSE. So epsilon and D are parameters. D is an integer between 1 and n, and epsilon is some fraction between 0 and 1 half. So this distribution D over matrices is an OSE if for any D-dimensional uh, linear subspace of Rn, a random matrix from this distribution preserves all vectors in that subspace with some constant probability. Okay. And again, you can get OSEs by doing the oblivious JL and um, union bounding over some net of your subspace. Okay. So an epsilon net of a d-dimensional subspace has size something like 1 over epsilon to the d. So you union bound over something like that. That would actually get you. That would actually get you a number of rows, which was like d log one over epsilon over epsilon squared. But there's a slightly smarter net you can take, which gets d over epsilon squared. Okay, so what's known? So previous work. Upper bounds. So I mean, I think the problem has only been kind of uh, studied only somewhat recently. So there, ha there haven't been any lower bounds yet. But in terms of upper bounds, it was known by as early as, say, Gordon in the 80s at some point. Um, and there's also Clartog and Mendelssohn. There's also, let's see, there's a paper by, well, let me say Clarkson and Woodruff using some tools from Aurora, uh, Kale, and Hazan. So all these things imply a bound of uh, d over epsilon squared. So Gordon shows that if you just choose a random Gaussian matrix, ah, you can choose m to be O of d over epsilon squared. So Gordon does it by just choosing a random Gaussian matrix. Clartog and Mendelssohn show that you can choose any matrix that has independent sub-Gaussian entries. Uh, Clarkson and Woodruff, using a net that, was, that appeared in this work, showed that um, any, basically any JL with the optimal number of rows implies it. Um, it's also worth mentioning that the first time OSCs appeared was in Sarloche's work. And he got something close. And, I'm, and uh, the motivation is basically what I talked about last week. So in terms of lower bounds, are there any other things like M and Clarkson bounds? Are there lower bounds that imply that kind of thing? Um, like high analogies to say on this net or something? Or lower bounds? On M? Uh, I don't think anyone has proven a lower bound better than D. And D is trivial because otherwise something would land in the kernel. 
So it, it might, there's, no, there's no lower bound of D over epsilon squared. Yeah. So open problem. <laughs> okay. If you take N to be D, you want to preserve everything. If D is high, you want to preserve the subspace, the D-dimensional subspace. I mean, so one thing I should say is, this lower bound can only possibly hold in the oblivious setting, right? Like, if you tell me what the subspace is, I can just, uh, you know, rotate and project down to the first D coordinate. So, in the non-oblivious case, you can get M being D. So this D over epsilon squared can only possibly be a lower bound in the oblivious setting. And we don't know that this is the correct thing to shoot for. So let me just also say that um, all of these original ones were dense, meaning all the entries are non-zero. So sparse OSCs, these are all upper bounds. So you could get, if you use the work I had with Daniel, plus, you know, these nets, like this net here and the argument from here, you would get M being D over epsilon squared and S being D over epsilon. Okay? So only, s I mean, basically it's just applying sparse JL to the subspace. Um, Clarkson and Woodruff, So you can get M being something like uh, 1 over epsilon squared D squared times log to the sixth of D over epsilon, and S being 1. And the thing that I talked about last week was M being D over epsilon squared and S being 1. Or you could also get M being d to the 1 plus gamma over epsilon squared, and s being 1 over epsilon. Okay. So now I can state all the bounds that I'm going to show you today. Question? Do you have a question? Oh, the d over epsilon squared? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You can get yes, that's correct. You can get a lot. You can get a yeah, yeah, yeah. You can okay. So you can get uh, a lower bound of d plus log d over epsilon squared log one over epsilon, or without even the log one over epsilon. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what you said is correct. Okay, so so this work. So for JL. We show that S needs to be um, one over epsilon. Uh, what, oh, sorry, one over epsilon times log n over log m over log n for any m which is less than something like uh, n over log one over epsilon. RIP, uh, so let's say constant epsilon, which is the case that matters for sparse recovery. 
we show that s needs to be omega k log n over k over log over uh, log of m over k log n over k as long as m is less than well n over log to the 2 plus gamma of m. Um, so at least in OSEs, in, in OSEs, if you want to apply an OSE to low rank approximation, you need epsilon to be um, subconstant. It needs to be like less than square root one over d or something like that, somewhere in between. Uh, yeah, so I don't know. So let's say you want to do like rank k approximation. I think somewhere in the proof you need to take epsilon to be root one over k or something like that. Don't quote me on this. But It depends on what your target yeah, goal is, right? So, yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. And then the last one is we show that any OSE with S equals 1 has M being at least D squared uh, as long. n is at least t d squared. I mean, you need to have some kind of thing like this because you can always check the identity matrix, right? So, uh, no, because when I, right? This is basically, this is basically the best you could hope for. So, so you, you can think of this as writing the min of n and d squared, which is, and then I can get rid of this. You can always, and you can always get n by the identity matrix, and you can get d squared by this right here. Okay, so any question about the statement of the results? Yeah, so this one? Oh, this is d squared. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 So definitely for uh, algorithmic complexity, multiplying by the matrix, you know, you can get a running time. If you want to multiply a times x, the running time will be s times the number of non-zero entries in x. So the smaller s is, the better for speed. Um, as for randomness complexity, well, uh, even in the dense case, a lot of these things you can get by using bounded independence. Um, Oh, right, right. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> so. So. For, our, for RIP.
Okay, why? Oh, so, okay, so for JL, for JL, you can get away with log n wise independence, and uh, n is overloaded, but um, n is the number of vectors you need to preserve. And for, K, for RIP, you need to preserve a, a net. And that net will have size, let me just write it here, uh, well, so let's say JL implies RIP. This was in that Barani Ukadal paper. Uh, net has size something like uh, n choose k, where n is the dimension, times uh, some constant to the k. Right, so since log n wise independence suffices, the number of random bits you need is log of the dimension times log of n choose k, which is k log n over k. So k times polylog random bits to specify the matrix. Yeah, pe so people do that. So in JL, there's the first work to do that was by Ilone and Chazelle, so near Ilone, who was here, and Bernard Chazelle. They showed that by using some kind of FFT-based approach, you can get uh, fast uh, Johnson and Strauss matrices. Um, and so I guess the, the downside of that approach versus using a sparse matrix is that that approach always takes the same amount of time, regardless of the sparsity of the input. So if you want something that's fast even for sparse inputs, then there's some input sparsity threshold where that the sparse matrix approach becomes faster. Um, same, same with RIP. So there's work by Rudelson and Vershin showing that if you sample those from a Fourier matrix, you'll get RIP. They don't get quite the, the correct number of rows, but they get close to it. Um, and for OSEs, well, JL implies OSE, so you can also use these Fourier-based approaches for OSEs. Yeah. Oh, I see. Right. Yeah, so I mean, I guess th there, there is a big difference, which is that when, so when you, for, for an OSC, when you get SC being one with M being D squared, your success probability is constant, but for RIP, so you want to preserve this k-dimensional subspace, which is reserved, which is defined by the sparsity pattern, but you want to preserve all n choose k such subspaces at the same time. So constant success probability is not enough to union bound over all n choose k of them. So that's one difference between the two. And I guess somehow that that requirement to succeed with so high probability is maybe why that's not ends up not being possible. Yeah, so, so that's related to an open problem that I want to state uh, hopefully at the end if I, if I have time. And if I don't have time, I'll make time. So I'll, there, there is something that I want to, there is one unifying uh, thing that I think is, is uh, not necessarily out of reach. Okay. okay. So now let's start proving stuff. Oh, and also I guess I should say for so our lower bounds hold for, you know, let's say for all of these, they hold for any matrix. But 
for any jail or any RRP matrix, but if in addition you tell me that um, all the non-zeros have the same magnitude, so for example, the jail matrix has plus minus one over root s everywhere, or the RIP matrix also has plus minus one over root s everywhere, then you can improve this restriction a little bit. So instead of n over log one over epsilon, you can, you can improve it to like m is less than n over six or something. And similarly, you can remove one of the logs. So um, it's, un it's not clear to me now, you know, is it, do I really need to make a, mo a slightly more severe restriction if I allow arbitrary entries? But anyway, that's close to, m is, it works all the way up to m being close to n anyway. It's just one is even closer to n than the other. So before I go into the proof for JL, I should say at least a couple words about the strategy for the proof. Um, and the proof is really going to be by, I guess I should say, pigeonhole principle. <laughs> OK, so uh, well. The heart of the proof is going to be the following lemma. And then you combine this lemma with a lot of use of pigeonhole principle. So the, the lemma is the following. Um, <coughs> suppose, oh, OK, so let me write it like this. Uh, oh, actually, OK, before I get to the lemma, as Ankur pointed out in the beginning, you know, like how, what are we going to prove exactly? We're going to show that there exists a set of points such that for that set of points, any matrix cannot be too sparse. Okay? So what's the set of points? So, so hard set of points. It's the same. Yeah. Is 0, E1, up to En. In Rn, so the n standard basis vector is in Rn, along with the zero vector, and that implies. So that uh, if you have, if you write your matrix A, so let's write the columns of this matrix. So JL says that, um, so first of all, what, is, what does EI get mapped to by A? It gets mapped to VI, okay? And JL says that the VIs, their distances should be close to what it, what it was for the EIs, okay? The distances for the EIs, for any EI and EJ, it's uh, square root of two, okay? And if you expand, you know, basically this comes about by, do people want me to show why this holds? So, basic, so basically, the, the, this bo boils down to vi minus vj squared is equal to vi squared plus vj squared minus 2 vi dot vj. Okay? So because you preserve, because 0 is in here, you should preserve ei minus 0, which is just ei. So all the vi's should have norm 1 plus minus epsilon. And vi minus vj should also have norm approximately what it should be. And if you just kind of uh, move these things around, it's going to tell you that vi dot vj should be O of epsilon. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, notice that if I 
take such a matrix and I normalize every column by its, by its norm, which is one plus minus epsilon, I'll still maintain the second property. So I can just assume th that it's actually exactly one. So the lemma that's kind of at the heart of everything is the following. So suppose x is less is greater than or equal to 2 epsilon, okay, some number. Then uh, no row of A can have more than two x two over x plus one values whose square is at least x. as long as m is less than n, so O of n over log 1 over epsilon. x is some value, yeah, at least 2 epsilon. Then I want to say, so I want to say that no, um, there can't be, no rows can have, so think of x as being large. This is saying that no row of A can have too many large values. Large means that the square of the value is at least x. And it can't have more than 2 over x plus 1. OK, so the proof of this. <coughs> Sorry, say it again. There'll be many non zeros in every. I want to prove that the sparsity is high. Yeah, that's right. Uh, there's one. There's one step which what you said didn't capture, but anyway, you'll see what. Uh, so actually, and for this lemma, I realized I don't need this. I need this for the next lemma. Okay, so, so here's the proof. So for the sake of contradiction, suppose that, uh, let, me, let me call it, suppose that there is, there is a row that has lots of such values. Um, <coughs> uh, let me say values, let me, let me write like this. So not just th not just that large, but they have the same sign. So suppose that there is a row. This is row J, such that it does have a lot of values that are bigger than root x, and the proof is the same if you say less than minus root x. So let's say that here, you know, here, and here, and now let me look at those entire columns. Okay, so these are the vectors vi1, vi2, and vi sub n, where capital N is bigger than 2 over x plus 1. 
all these values are large. So I'm going to take, I'm going to um, consider the vector where I zero out these values. And the zeroed version, I'm going to call ui1, you know, ui2, et cetera. Okay. Now, let's look at ui a dot product of ui b. Okay. That's equal to VIA dotted with VIB uh, minus the product of these two entries. So that's at most that minus X, which is at most epsilon minus X. And X is at least two epsilon, so this is at most X over two. Right? So now let's look at the following vector. The sum from i from oh, oh yeah minus x over two. So the sum from a equals one to uh, n of u i a. Let's look at that vector's norm squared. That's at least zero. And that's at most. Well, when you expand out the you know this vector dot product with itself, you'll have the diagonal terms. And u i a dotted with u i a. You know, that's at most the norm of VIA, which is at most one. So you'll get that n times. And then the, di the off diagonal terms come uh, n, n minus one times, and you get x over two, right? So if you just rearrange this thing, you get that, so move that over here, x over two, n minus one is at most one, and let me move this over here, that's two over x is at least n minus one, uh, but that's bigger than two over x. So you get that two over x is bigger than itself, so it's hard to Okay. So here's another lemma, which I'm, I'll just say how to prove it without proving it. It's, um, uh, suppose I tell you that S times ln of Q over S is bigger than or equal to R, and uh, S is less than Q over E, and Q over R is bigger than some constant, then S is omega R, R over ln uh, Q over R. Okay, so, I mean, this is something that's not too hard to prove. Basically, you note that this function on the left is an increasing function as long as S is less than Q over E, and then and then you say, well, I know it's increasing, so let me set it to be some, co some very small constant times this value. OK. <laughs> OK, good. So yeah, you can do this yourself. So. <laughs> OK, so now the next lemma is that if m is less than uh, sorry, O of n over log 1 over epsilon, then s is at least 1 over epsilon. Okay. Actually, uh, yeah, isolate this. <laughs> so, Let's uh, fix a row ought. So uh, then we say we 
sure I'm not uh, over this thing. Okay, so fix a row I. and define SI to be the set of all columns such that AIJ squared is at least two epsilon. Also, let uh, SI plus be the positive values in SI, or be the positive value, meaning uh, SI plus is the one where the AIJs are actually positive, and SI minus are the are those only. Okay. So um, I'm going to show that. So you know, for the sake of contradiction, suppose that S is small, less than one over four epsilon. Let's say. Um, then I'm going to arrive at a contradiction. And the way I'm going to do it is, well, first, let me estimate. So basically, SI is like the heavy guys in row I. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to estimate what's the sum of all heavy values in the matrix. Okay, so if I sum up the squares of the entire matrix, I should get n, right? Because every column has unit norm, there are n columns. I'm going to show that if S is too small, then the sum of all squares in the matrix is going to be something less than n. So let's look at the sum. Huh? Oh, is that, oh, is that what you said? Oh, OK. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so let's look at. Uh, So this is equal to the size of SI plus times the expected value x. So x is a random uh, AIJ from SI plus, a random AIJ squared. So that's equal to the size of SI plus times the integral from 0 to 1 of the probability that x is bigger than x dx, which is uh, at most, let's say, um, four epsilon si plus. Actually, I think I can do two epsilon plus the integral from two epsilon to one of the probability that of uh, okay, so SI plus times this probability is just the number of guys in that row who are big, and then I'm going to apply the lemma which says that I can't have too many such guys. So this is at most um, two epsilon SI plus plus the integral from 2 epsilon to 1 of 2 over x plus 1 dx. And this thing is at most uh, 2 epsilon si plus. plus um, so that's like log of 1 over epsilon. So that implies that the sum of squares of all entries in A is at most. Um, so first there's the small entries. So that gives me 2 epsilon times ns minus the sum of si. 
Right, and sim so that this was SI plus, and similarly you could get the same thing for SI minus. And then SI is just the union of SI plus and SI minus, so you get the size of SI itself. So the number of light guys is NS minus, minus the total number of heavy guys. So this is the light guys. And then the heavy elements, you get um, two epsilon times the sum of their sizes plus O of M over ln 1 over epsilon. Right, and then this, um, and we know that this thing should equal N. And this thing uh, cancels with that. And we get uh, 2 epsilon NS. So this is the heavy. This, this whole summation should equal N. No, it should equal N. This is equal, oh, oh, oh. Oh, I see, because this, is, this itself was an upper bound. Um, so this, is, yeah, it should be at least N. So that implies that uh, n minus 2 epsilon ns should be at most O of m over log 1 over epsilon. And we said that s was small. So this thing is at least n over 2. And then there's a contradiction because I said m was Wait a second. Oh no, yeah, so this this should have been m times log 1 over epsilon. Something didn't look right. Yes? Questions? So now we're just going to prove it, the last step. No, but at, this proves that S is at least 1 over epsilon. I want to show 1 over epsilon times log n over log m over log n. Do you have a guess for the next step? Any guesses? No, really? So a theorem is that S has to be, so m is less than n over log 1 over epsilon implies that S is at least 1 over epsilon times log N over log M over log N. Okay, so um, now we're going to do pigeonhole. Huh? Oh, okay, As in, now we're going to do pigeonhole. So this is what we're going to say. Uh, we're going to do an argument very similar to this, except we're not going to zero out just one row. We're going to zero out many rows. And the idea is the following. We're going to say, so look at, look at every column, OK? Every column has, uh, we're going to define a pattern that corresponds to that column. So, so uh, every column, look at its t locations. in M corresponding to the largest entries in magnitude. OK? <coughs> the uh, pattern of that column is the signs of those entries the rounding of each entry 
So uh, if square is a multiple of 1 over 2s, and the location. And then we do pigeonhole. So first of all, how many patterns are there? So the number of signs is 2 to the t. The locations um, is m choose t. And the roundings, well, after you, so originally the sum of squares of everything was 1. Um, then after you rounded, uh, each guy could have increased by 1 over 2s, let's say. So now it's one at most 1 plus t over 2s. And they're all, they're all, the squares are all in integer multiples of 1 over 2s. So the number of ways here was 2 to the t. Here it's m choose t. Here it's the number of ways to write something that's at most 1 plus t over 2s as a sum of multiples of 1 over 2s. So if you just multiply 2s by, through by both of these things, basically you want to write something that's at most 2s plus t as a sum of positive integers. So that's at most 2s plus t choose t. Okay. So a pigeonhole implies there exists uh, which one? M choose T. Yeah. <coughs> um, so there exists a set of, there exists, uh, I guess, N over 2 to the T times M choose T times 2S plus T choose T uh, of s columns with the same pattern. So what are we going to do? We're going to do something very similar as last time. So here's, here's our matrix A. And so that pattern corresponds to t different rows. And there are different, there are capital N columns. Maybe I should use a different color, I don't know. So this is VI1, VI2, VIN. And all the guys here in these, so all the guys in these entries in a given row all have the same sign, and they're all almost equal to each other up to this 1 over 2s. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to zero out all of these. Okay. And <laughs> that gives me new vectors. Uh, you know, ui1, ui etc. And now I'm going to look at uia dot product with uib, where a is not equal to b. So that's equal to via dotted with vib minus. Um, sum, let's say from, uh, oh, I'm already using A, uh, J equals 1 to T of V I A J V I B J. Okay. And this thing is at most epsilon, that's at most epsilon minus um, the sum from J equals 1 to T of V I A J V I A J plus or minus one over square root of S to S. And since I'm trying to upper bound it, I guess I should put a minus here. Well, there's a minus out there. Mm 
exactly s of equal magnitude? Um, I mean, basically, I want to. I'm going to upper bound this thing by something like negative t over s. So before in the old lemma, uh, I got. Okay, well, I guess uh, it's not. So. Oh, okay, yes. That's right. But what are you what are you saying about this graph? Um, is that the worst case? Probably. I mean, the bound we're going to get up is up to a constant of what you just said. So, so this thing is equal to uh, epsilon minus, let me say, VIA projected onto, let's say, the pattern squared plus uh, 1 over root 2s times VIA projected onto the pattern L1 norm. And then you do Cauchy-Schwartz on this. That has t entries. So it's at most root t times the L2 norm. So we have epsilon minus VIA P VIA uh, projected on T uh, minus root T over 2S. Is that right? And, oh, sorry, P is the. The locate, it's a set of locations of these rows. And I chose the pattern to be the heaviest coordinate. Did I say that? I hope I did. So this thing has at least, at least an L2 squared. It has at least a t over s fraction of the mass. So this is at least root t over s. So this thing is at, le is at most um, epsilon minus. So this thing, basically, what I'm trying to say is it's at least some constant times VIA P L2. So epsilon uh, minus some constant times VIA P. Um, and this is at least root T over S. Uh, and sorry, this is squared. This is at least T over S. So this is at most uh, negative some constant prime T over S uh, as long as. I choose t over s to be much bigger than epsilon. So in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose t to be some big constant times epsilon s. t should be an integer. So the reason I had to show that previous lemma first is I need to make sure t is at least 1. And since s is at least 1 over epsilon, that's true. So now I do the trick from last time where I say 0 is at most the sum of all those UIAs, L2 norm squared, which is at most capital N minus some C T over S N and minus one. Okay. And um, that implies that uh, C T over S N minus one. Is that right? Sorry. Is that most one? So moving in S, I get a, a lower bound on S. Okay. And then you do some, I mean, I don't want to spend time on stuff that's. So th yeah, so capital N is that value. And then you do some calculations involving th that, you know, lemma over there. Uh, that lemma over there, which I didn't prove. And basically, you'll, you'll just get it. OK? Any questions about anything? 
Well, I, I needed t to be, I need t to be an integer, so it should be at least one. So first I need to show that s has to be, basically there are two cases. It's a, it's a proof, okay, so you can view it overall as a proof by contradiction. So suppose s is less than the target bound. Now if s is really tiny, it's less than one over epsilon, there's gonna be a contradiction basically by choosing t being one. And then by doing that uh, business, and if s is bigger than one over epsilon, then I'll set t to be something bigger than one according to this, and then I'll get a contradiction like that. That's exactly the same, but then, I mean, yeah, sure, you can do that. Um, I mean, I mean, I guess in your calc, so if, if it's the ceiling, then in your calculations, you'll say, if s is less than one over epsilon, this will happen, you know, this bound is true, so, so, uh, you, maybe you don't have to write it as two separate lemmas, but uh, but I think it's so for R. Now we're going to do the RIP proof. So the theorem for RIP is basically S. So m is less than something like n over, I'm gonna write log t then, though you can get it for two plus gamma as you'll see in the proof. That implies that s has to be at least something like k log n over k over log of m over k log n over k. Okay, and uh, so as long as epsilon is less than some constant for epsilon. Right, because, yeah, exactly. So yeah, so it means it has to be dense, that's right. Unless you blow up the number of rows. <coughs> so the proof. Okay, so the first thing is uh, so look at some column I of the matrix. So, you know, if you're RIP, you need to preserve, in particular, the one-sparse vectors. Oh, and let's say K is at least two. Uh, you need to preserve the one-sparse vectors, meaning that the norms of every, uh, the norm of every column should be at least one. Or it should be one plus or minus delta. So you can say that it needs to be at least a half, for example. The norm of every column needs to be at least a half. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say that um, there cannot be too many very small uh, entries, okay? So the uh, number of, let me make sure I say the correct constant. So the weight of values at least uh, one over root two s in magnitude, uh, let me say four root two root s is at least a quarter, right? So uh, the number of entries in the column is at most s, so the total amount of weight in the things below one over two root s is at most s over four s, which is a quarter, but you know the total weight has to be half. Therefore, the heavy entries, the ones that have at least one over two root s in magnitude, constitute at least a quarter of, a constant fraction of the net. Okay, so it's gonna be again proof by contradiction. So for the sake of contradiction, suppose s is less than what it should be.
So the first claim There exists a scale t in 1 up to log s such that number of squared values in ith column bigger than or equal to uh, 2 to the t over 8s is at least um, s over 2 to the t plus 1 uh, t squared. Huh? It's, uh, it's, it's going to be, I don't know if you can call it pigeonhole, but, well, maybe you have another proof in mind. It's going to be, it's going to be the same proof as that basically. The total mass will be too small. Yeah, yeah that's what it's going to be. And I mean, th and the proof of that is going to be the same. The same argument. I mean, basically, um, the fact that uh, you can write the expectation as the integral of this probability. So the proof is just, so uh, suppose not. So all scales have few large values. Oh, then maybe you were thinking a step ahead. Once we have the claim, we're going to do pigeonhole. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so. Um, the sum over large j uh, for ith column of a j i squared is equal to so um, let me let me say s is the set of large rows for i column. And x is the square of a random a, j, i for j and s. That's equal to the size of s times the expectation of x, which is equal to the size of s times the integral from 0 to 1, so let's say 0 to infinity of the probability that x is bigger than x dx, which is at most, I think uh, the cutoff I want is 4s. Okay, so capital big S over 4 little s is the sparsity, um, plus the size of capital S times the integral from 1 over 4s to infinity of the probability that x is bigger than x dx. So if, so if this is true at all scales, in particular it's true at the first scale, which implies that capital S itself is small, right? So that's what, at scale one. So, um, so this thing is actually, capital S itself should be uh, of size less than S over four. And then I can write this thing as the sum over all scales So this should be the number of guys in S who are bigger than little x. So um, I'm upper bounding that by basically rounding little x to the nearest scale. And at the at scale, it says that the square is um, 2t over 8s. So I can put 2t over 8s. And the length of the scale is Oh, I have fewer than that. So I have, I have fewer than this number of guys. So that's s over 
2 to the t plus 1 t squared times um, how long is that scale? 2 to the t over 8f. So that cancels that, that cancels that. And this is basically some convergent sum. That's why I chose the t squared. And this is less than or plus That's the concept. And um, so I said over there that instead of, so I said here in the theorem statement, I said m should be less than n over log cubed n. But there I promised you n over log to the 2 plus gamma. Basically, you just need this sum to be convergent. So you could have chosen it to be 2 to the n. Okay, so, so now what are we going to do? So, so back to the main proof. I'm going to define. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to define some parameter u. U to be the max of one, and I guess two to the four minus t s over k. Okay, and. I'm going to define a pattern for a column as um, so, right, so OK. So t, I'm going to choose, so now that we've shown this claim, that the t that I'm saying there is the t from that claim. There exists a t such that the number of squared values that are bigger than blah is large. So that's that t. So I'm going to define a pattern for a column as um, a choice of u of its s over 2 to the t plus 1 times t squared large. Yeah. And so f I'm going to do some pigeonhole first. And I'm going to say, well, the number of total patterns arising from the matrix is, OK, so first of all, just by pigeonhole, there have to be at least n over log s columns that, that chose the same t. And of those n over log s columns that chose the same t, the number of patterns they give rise to is n over log s times, um, well, they have a lot of large guys, uh, 2 to the minus t minus 1 times s over t squared. Choose u. That's the number of patterns they give rise to. And the number of total patterns possible is, oh, so, uh, oh, plus the signs. Well, it's 2 to the u times m choose u. So implies there exists uh, z greater than or equal to, oh, let me call it capital, well, z greater than or equal to that uh, number of columns sharing a pattern. Um, so now we're going to have three cases. We're going to have two cases. Z, if z is bigger than or equal to k, what we're going to do is we're just going to put, um, just choose k of those guys arbitrarily and put a bunch of ones there and look at that case sparse vector. And if z is less than k, then we'll just put the ones where, where in those z locations. And u 
so we're going to use RIP. So case one, Z is at least K. So uh, consider the vector Um, so consider the vector that has ones in these, in uh, in some arbitrary choice. The vector v, let's call it, uh, of k of these locations. So first we have that the norm squared of V is K. And the second thing we have that is for each J in the pattern, so this is like some set of rows, remember. We have that AVJ squared is at least uh, K squared times, so the K squared is because the signs match and we sum it up and we get a factor of k. And how big is that entry? It's uh, 2 to the t over 8x. Right. Uh, I defined it as being. Yeah. So, and so this implies that av squared is at least um, and there are u of these guys, is at least k squared times 2 to the t over 8s times u, and u was the max of two things, so that's at least uh, k squared times 2 to the t over 8s times 2 to the 4 minus t s over k. That cancels that k, that cancels that, that cancels that. And this is at, this is equal to two k. Right. So if my distortion parameter was less than the hat was less than one or whatever, this uh, is a function. So case two is z less than k. So then we know that, so what are we going to do? We're going to choose v has z ones in appropriate locations. So we know that the norm of v square, the squared norm of v is equal to z. And we know that, oh, okay, so, so now we're going to have like case, let's call it case 2a, is that u is 1. So 1 is the max of those two numbers. So in that case, we have that a, v, j. So for all j in the, oh, the pattern is of size 1. So um, a, v, j squared is at least, z squared times 2 to the t over 8s. Okay, and then now I'm going to write what z is. So that's equal to z times, what's z? Um, oh, good. So z is that value, and u is 1. So I have n times s over uh, 2 to the t plus 1 t squared. And then I have log, and then I have uh, log s times 2 times m. Right? 
and then I have times that 2 to the t over 8s. So this is just z. And then I start canceling stuff. s cancels s, 2 to the t cancels 2 to the t. And then now I have that 2, I'm going to put a 4 here. So the bottom line is that that implies that av l2 norm squared is at least z times um, n over t squared is certainly at most, t is at most log s, and log s is at most log n. So this is at most log cubed n. So like some con so 8 times log cubed n times n. Um, well, it's actually some other constant that does this. And then now what I said was that m, I said m is less than, you know, some really small constant times that. So this is at least 2z. So the very last case is case 2D, where u is actually equal to the other thing, which is 2 to the fourth minus t, s over k. And then now, uh, I'll just again calculate, um, what do I want to say? Oh, good. So let's write, let's calculate z itself. So we're going to show, so notice we're in case 2, which means z is less than k. We're going to show that if we're in case 2b, then z is actually bigger than k, which contradicts the fact that we're in case 2. So z is equal to, well, it's at least that thing, um, n times, oh, and, and we're going to use the fact that, you know, n choose, n choose k is at m always at most e n over k to the k, and it's always at least n over k to the k, using the standard fact. So this thing is n times uh, well, n over log s times, yeah. Okay. <coughs> yeah. 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 Oh, you mean I don't need to preserve? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think what you're saying is correct. Yeah, I think what you're saying is correct. That's true. Any, or did everyone understand this question? So RIP says that you both don't blow up the norm too much and you don't shrink it too much. So suppose that you only require that you don't blow it up too much. And you also enforce that every column of the matrix has norm exactly one. Then does this lower bound still apply? And, and the, I believe it does. So, okay, so since we have five minutes, I'll just say one thing about OSE without actually doing any calc any of the proof. So, um, it's just going to be standard, you know, Yao's minimax. So, you just say, like, if you know, for all w, the probability over this this embedding that I uh, preserve. Yes. And the hard distribution is something itself very simple. You just choose D of the n standard basis vectors randomly. Right? 
So, yeah, even B. So, yeah, so let me just, just, you know, probably most of you have seen this, but just in case someone hasn't seen it, so I would just say, if it's true for all W, that means it's true for a distribution over Ws. Uh, so that's at least four fifths, right? That's at least four fifths. Which, uh, which you know, you can switch these around and you can say that's uh, probability over pi, probability over W implies that there exists a pi such that the probability of W is large. And then you show that there can't exist such a pi unless M is at least least squared, if it has twice as many. Well, I mean, presumably, if you did try to prove such a lower bound, it, it would be through Yao's mini match principle, but. Um, yeah, I think it would have to be, you'd have to choose something else. Yeah, maybe maybe a random deep dimensional subspace itself. Sorry, this is OSC. Okay, so in the last five minutes, let me state this open problem. So someone previously asked if there was a unifying theorem that would, was it Moses, maybe? A unifying theorem that would imply you know, like very, these things are very similar, OSC and uh, JL, et cetera. Basically, they all derive from applying JL to some net. So is there something that you can say which uh, simultaneously captures everything? So there was a paper by uh, Clartog and Mendelssohn. Which says, so first, suppose you have a subset T of uh, Rn and a norm x norm. So there is what's called, so Tallegrand's gamma 2 functional is defined as uh, gamma 2 t x norm is the inf over t i. I'll define what I, what I mean by this. Of the sum s equals 0 or 1 to infinity of 2 to the s over 2 times the inf, sorry, the inf of the soup over x and t of the sum s equals 1 to infinity of 2 to the s over 2 times the uh, diameter with respect to ti of x. So let me define what I mean by this. So Ti itself, so T0 is a subset of T1, which is a subset of, is a subset of T capital N, which is T. Okay? So you start with T and you keep taking like nets of your subspace. Okay? But don't think of it as, a, as an epsilon net where everything must be within epsilon. You're allowed to choose these Ti's however you want. Admissible. means that the size of ti can be at most 2 to the 2 to the i. Okay, so you're allowed to choose the sequence of nets where the ith one has size at most 2 to the 2 to the i, and also where t0 has size 1. Um, and the diameter sub ti of x is, look at the closest point. Um, so look at the set ti. And it defines, it defines basically some clustering of T. Because for each point in T, for each point X in T, you map it to the closest thing in TI. Okay? What does the X do? It's the, di so, so. Yeah, the soup over X's. Of the cluster. Exactly. The diameter of the cluster in TI which contains X. 
So anyway, there's some uh, <laughs> definition of this thing. And the relevant theorem, or one, one important theorem, is that, so theorem, and I'll tell you who proved it soon, is that for any T subset of Rn bounded, well let's say also uh, we have that uh, the expected soup over x and t of g dot x, where g is a random Gaussian vector whose entries are independent with mean 0 and variance 1. This is at most some constant times gamma 2 of t with respect to the L2 norm. And it's also at least some other constant prime times gamma 2 of t with respect to the L2 norm. This was proven by Telegram. And this, I think, is usually attributed to Fernique and Fizier. So I think Fernique first proved it, and then I think Fizier had some extensions. And the theorem from uh, Clartog and Mendelssohn Is the following. So choose a random sign matrix, let's say. It could be any matrix with sub Gaussian entries. A random dense sign matrix. <coughs> with M being something like, uh, oh, good. So we're doing JL. And so I'll say, I'll say what I mean soon. So with m being something like O of gamma 2 squared t with the L2 norm plus 1 over, over epsilon squared. Yeah, so exactly. So if you think of just the JL lemma itself, Okay, so what, what I didn't tell you what T is. So T is the set of Xi minus Xj over the norm of Xi minus Xj. So remember JL, you want to preserve distances between X1 up to Xn. So define T as this set of unit norm vectors. There are, there are entries two of them. And Clark Target Mendelssohn said the number of rows just needs to be gamma 2 squared of that set, which is some function of the geometry of the set, right? Because because of this uh, Telegram theorem, we know that, and, and Fernique Fizier, we know that gamma 2 is something involving the geometry of the set T. Right? It's the expected soup of g dot x for x and t. So for example, if t is an arbit so if, if x1 up to xn are an arbitrary set of n vectors, then, uh, then these are some n squared arbitrary unit vectors. So let's look at g dot x. And you have, you have n squared different g dot x's. The soup is going to be at most root log n squared, which is like root log n. So gamma 2 squared is like log n. So you get log n over epsilon squared. So that implies the JL lemma. How about subspace embeddings, OSEs? So there, um, so you have a d dimensional subspace. So because of rotational invariance of the Gaussian, you can assume it's just the first d coordinates. So what's the expected soup of g dot x? It's the L2 norm of g, which is root d. So gamma 2 squared is d. So you get d over epsilon squared. Same thing with RIP. So the problem is that <coughs> even if you're used to like part of the number of the set, you can still like you know, you know. select the uh, and you can also say something more directly about the expected soup of what is the set of Which theorem? Uh, yeah, except I mean actually the proof of this theorem is not too hard and it doesn't it doesn't even, uh, it's, the proof of this theorem is directly in terms of gamma 2. It doesn't ever mention this expression. So I mean, the lower bound might be much more intuitive from the expected set. Yeah. Am I understanding correctly that the expected 
Sorry, what do you mean? Just say it again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So here, like the other place, the employer is going to be the employer now. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. So you know, clearly the pay on the other employer is going to be tight lower bound. Uh, tight lower bound meaning any embedding needs gamma 2 squared or epsilon squared, or any, or a random sign matrix needs that. Oh, fr from the the one we have, you mean? Yeah. 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 Yeah.